Good morning. It's a joy to gather together as the people of God. Welcome to our time of worship this morning at Paradise Holschwam. Just a few quick announcements as we begin our service. First of all, uh, we want to offer our condolences to Charles Bosserman as his uh, brother had passed away this last week, and we want to offer peace and comfort for the Bosserman family. Also, uh, I want to let everybody know that Peggy Staub passed away this last week after being on hospice. And uh, if you are interested, there is an address for her son in the bulletin if cards would like to be sent to him on her behalf. Finally, uh, there's a new address for the Wildesons, and that's also in our bulletin and the newsletter that was sent out. So please do make sure to update your address books with that. Are there any other announcements this morning? Then let's prepare our hearts to worship as we listen to the prayer. Please join now in our invocation hymn, verse 3 of number 203, which is away in a manger. Gracious God, we thank you that you bring us together to worship you. We ask that in your presence we may know your peace and your love. Grant us unity in your spirit and grant us solidarity in your love. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to join in our call to worship, which is taken from Psalm 112. 
respond in the bold print. Surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their horn will be lifted high in honor. Amen. Please join in our opening hymn, number 179, Joy to the World. does make the wonders of his love known to us. Therefore, let us respond in faithful love to the love that we have been given by God. I invite you now to join with me as we confess our sins in our unison prayer of confession. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Let us now silently confess our sins to God. Having now confessed our sins with the words of our lips and the prayers of our hearts, hear this good news, that it is in the name of Jesus Christ that our sins are forgiven. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is from the book of Genesis, chapter 18, verses 16 through 33. Genesis 18, beginning at verse 16. 
When the men got up to leave, they looked down toward Sodom, and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away and went toward Sodom, but Abraham, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it to you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? The Lord said, If I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham spoke up again. Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous people is five less than fifty? Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five people? If I find forty-five there, he said, I will not destroy it. Once again he spoke to him, what if only forty are found there? He said, for the sake of forty, I will not do it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only 30 can be found there? He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Abraham said, Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if only 20 can be found there? He said, For the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, May the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. What if only 10 can be found there? He answered, For the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left And Abraham returned home. Our next reading is from the book of Romans, chapter 5, verses 12 through 21. Romans 5, beginning at verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned, to be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's once again turn to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you We thank you that you have gathered us as your people, that you have reminded us that we find forgiveness of sins in you. And as we just remember, as we just remembered reading your your words there in Romans, that we find righteousness 
through the actions of the one man, that is Jesus Christ our Lord. We give you thanks that through his work, not only do we find our sins forgiven, but we find ourselves on a path to life everlasting. We thank you, Lord, that your everlasting life is a promise that we have in you, a promise that we have as you care for your people. We think of our sister Peggy Staub, and we think of Charles's brother Dan, who have gone to be with you. Lord, we hold on to the hope of the promise that we have in you as we remember those who have gone before us. And Lord, we ask that we would not only see the renewal of the life that is yet to come when we pass from this life to the next, but we pray that we would also see the renewal of your kingdom here on earth today. That your love, your mercy, your compassion, your justice, your forgiveness, that those values that come from your kingdom will reign here on earth today. And as your people, as your church, we live together according to those kingdom values, according to the life that you led today. And so, as an act of faith, we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught all his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to join in our sermon hymn, God of Grace and God of Glory, number 569.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have here to gather and meditate upon your word. We ask that you would open our hearts and minds to the power of your scripture, the power of your spirit, and the power of Jesus, our Lord. Grant me your words of life to proclaim. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the fundamental beliefs that we have about Jesus that we affirm in our time of confession and the forgiveness after that, the assurance of pardon, is that the power of the righteousness of Jesus is enough to cover over our sins. There's nothing that we could do that would overpower the work of Jesus, right? There's no sin that we could commit that would be so grievous that Jesus would need to get back on the cross. The work that Jesus did was once and for all. And we see there in the book of Romans that we entered into this sinful nature, if we go back in our biblical story through the life of Adam. We have this sinful nature that has haunted humanity from generation to generation to generation, but it's always been God's plan that uh, something redemptive could be done. And indeed, we see that plan of redemption unfold in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. As it says in Romans 5, just as one trespass resulted in the condemnation for all people, so one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. That's something that is very important to us as Christians. That's the good news, right? That we are accepted by God not because of the good things that we have done, but because of the goodness of Jesus. It's for us to receive. It's not for us to earn. One of the things that I've loved about studying the book of Genesis and looking at the life of Abraham and learning about God as Abraham learns about God is that you see there's this unfolding of understanding of who God is. In the section that I read to you uh, from Genesis chapter 18, we know what's about to happen. We know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and uh, it was a, a place where God was going to bring judgment. But there's a problem for Abraham there. He has his nephew Lot living there. And so Abraham does something pretty remarkable. He goes and he challenges God. This whole interaction, Abraham is saying, what type of God are you? I mean, hear this language. This is pretty audacious. I don't know that I would feel comfortable talking to God like this. Then Abraham approached him and said, The Lord, will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked. You hear what he's saying? You're not that kind of God, are you? That God who is going to ignore the righteous and you're just going to let them be swept up by the wicked, with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike? Far be it from you. Here's that question at the end. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? So when Abraham heard the Lord's plan, what's his assumption? That his plan is not right. Because he challenges God. Because he says, what about the righteous who are there? Are you really going to let them get swept up? And then... Uh, you can't even call what happens next a negotiation or a, a bargaining or anything. God just gives in to what Abraham asks. What if there's 50? Okay. What if there's 45? All right. What if, what if there's 40? Okay. What if there's 30? What if there's 20? What if there's 10? And every time God says, yes, 
Yes, I will spare Sodom if the righteous people are found there. Even ten. And you have to wonder if Abraham, in his boldness, because undoubtedly he's got his nephew Lot in his mind, could have just said, God, what if there's just one righteous person? One righteous person in Sodom. Will you spare the destruction you have planned for that city? Not get them out of there and then bring destruction, but will you spare the whole place for the sake of that one righteous person? It's easy to think that God's answer would have been in line with going down, well, what if five less? What if five less? What if ten less? What if ten less, right? It's easy to imagine that God would say, yes, for one righteous, for the sake of one righteous person, I will spare this unrighteous city. But we know what happens next. The two angels arrive at Sodom, they find it as they describe, uh, and judgment does come to the city. Now Lot and his daughters and his wife are escorted out of the city and spared, but ultimately the, the city is destroyed. The next morning it says in Genesis 19, Abraham got up and returned to the place where he had stood before the Lord. He looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward the land of the plain, and he saw dense smoke rising from the land like smoke from a furnace. So when, so when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham, and he brought out Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew the cities where Lot had lived. It seems as if no righteous person was found uh, in, in Sodom, much less ten. Destruction did come, but Lot and his family were spared. So why does the text tell us that Lot was spared? What well, says this? Once again, remember, God remembered Abraham. He remembered Abraham. Now, when we think about Abraham, is he perfect? No, he's not. In these last encounters, he's had a real hard time believing God. In fact, he believes God, but then the circumstances of his life get difficult, and then he struggles to believe. In Genesis 15, 6, it tells us that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So God does see Abraham on some level as righteous. And he sees that there's a special purpose that Abraham and his family are going to have back from Genesis 18. Uh, Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. By doing what is right and just. Abraham is not a perfect man, but he is trying to live in a way that pleases God, and, and he serves for us as a good example of faith. One who's not perfect, but who time and time again does turn to the Lord, even if he needs some encouragement. So for the sake of Abraham, Lot is spared. Because if you read that account in Genesis, Lot is no angel. He does some pretty despicable things. Lot is spared because of Abraham. So what's this have to do with Jesus? And what's this have to do with the book of Romans? Well, friends... Basically, the short version is this. If God would spare Lot for the sake of Abraham, how much will God spare us for the sake of Jesus? How do we see that? Well, first of all, we're learning something about God here. It's in the character of God that it is okay to spare the unrighteous for the sake of the righteous. It's not that we're just going to usher the righteous out and let the unrighteous be destroyed in Sodom. What was the 
what was said. The Lord said in verse 26 of Genesis 18, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. The whole place. And then that number goes down and down and down. So we see here the idea that God is willing to spare unrighteous people for the sake of the righteous. We also know that there's something that's true back with Sodom that is true with us today. If God showed up here, we might not think that our wickedness is crying out to the Lord with the same uh, need that God would send angels to see it with his own eyes, but if God showed up here, if God even showed up this morning in our congregation, would God find people who are righteous on their own? No. We are people who've been marred by sin. Our, our righteousness is not our own. It comes from Christ. Galatians talks about how we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. So what we see here is God pointing to the idea that more people can be saved, the unrighteous, for the sake of the righteous. And this is important because Abraham took an active role in it. He didn't even name Lot, but undoubtedly Lot was on his mind. But he is willing to intercede on the behalf of Lot and even this wicked city and say, God, won't you have mercy? Won't you spare these people? And God was responsive to that. So for us today, this is what that means. We have a God who is still willing to spare the unrighteous for the sake of the righteous. Am I that righteous man? Are you that righteous person? Ultimately, we recognize, no. Our righteousness isn't because we've lived good, obedient lives. We're called to that, but our righteousness comes from someone else. And that's from Jesus Christ, our Lord. And it is for the sake of Jesus that the unrighteous may be spared. And we may be invited to have the righteousness that comes from Christ. But we're also invited into the role of Abraham. So we learn that God is willing to do this, but we also are invited into the role of Abraham who intercedes in the world around him. We intercede by pointing back to Jesus. We intercede in the world around us by saying, you know what? There is a lot of wickedness. There is a lot of brokenness. But we know a God who seeks to make things right. And we pray to God that the world would come to know him. We live in a way that the world would come to know him. And we proclaim the good news so that the world may know him. So for us today, we can pattern our lives after that faithful intercession of Abraham as we look out. We're not called to look at the world around us and say, oh, God, how about you bring judgment on those people over there, but, you know, to save my nephew Lot. It's easy to do that. It's how a lot of people act, but that's not what Abraham did, and that's not what Jesus did, right? For God so loved the world, all of us. We're called to take up that same path that Abraham did, interceding in a world that desperately needs God's mercy and love and redemption. So for us today, may we see whether it's in the story in Genesis or in the book of Romans or wherever we find it throughout the gospel, that this is the kind of God that we serve, a God who has mercy even on those who are not deserving of mercy. We also have a God who has interceded on our behalf in Jesus Christ our Lord, and we have a God who is the righteous one who will spare us for his sake. May we live as people proclaiming this righteous God, Jesus our Lord, and may we live knowing that we are saved through him. Amen.
I invite you now to join as we affirm our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Sisters and brothers, what is it that we believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, we serve a God who is generous and good. May we sing praise now to him for his goodness. Jesus Christ, in whom we find our righteousness, and in him our sins are forgiven. Receive now this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.